welcome to The Cannabis Professor, a marijuana science and culture podcast, broadcasting from the state of Pennsylvania to the rest of the nation and the world. My name's Scott, I'm your professor, and thanks for joining me today. Now, in many classic stories, there is usually some sort of hero and a villain. You know, in the modern world, we have sort of what the superhero films, the comics, you have Superman and Lex Luthor, right? Hero and villain. Uh, we go to the Disney side of stories, and we have things like Prince Aladdin and Jafar, one of my personal favorite Disney movies. And uh, if you go real, real far back, you'll find one of the all-time greatest matchups with Jesus the Savior Christ versus the soul-snatching devil of hell, Satan the Serpent, right? So always a bit of a hero and a villain situation. But in The Legend of Weed... Who exactly will be our hero? And who might be our villain? Well, so far, the closest I think we come to heroes of our cannabis legend are people who are famed advocates like uh, Arthur Jack Herrer, or Herrer, I think is how you pronounce that, or even folks like old Ricky Simpson, right? The infamous Canadian who spread the method of high potency concentrates RSO, namely. And believe me, they will have their episodes deservingly and respectedly. But they would be the heroes, right? And without villains, there wouldn't be a need for heroes. So really, villains technically come first, I guess, right? And that means we're looking for our antagonist of our story. Who will be our dastardly chum of the evening? Well, there are many candidates to choose from. Oh, so many folks in history who have screwed over marijuana or done bad things. But I think much like the alphabet, today we're going to start with the letter A. Because A is for Anslinger. And in this episode, we're going to take a look into the life of Harry J. Anslinger, head of the original Bureau of Narcotics, and what I think a lot of us would consider the father of the war on drugs. Now, we want to see exactly how he became such an imposing figure in the story of cannabis. But some of you may already know his name. Uh, He is probably one of those important pillars if you ever look up the history of weed. He'll definitely come up. And he actually served as one of the largest contributors to our current difficult and inaccurate stigma against cannabis and that we still fight today. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I made a podcast. And so he is definitely somebody worth knowing, worth looking into. And from the looks of it, also someone who is clearly racist and sexist. But I'm going to let you decide on that judgment. So, everybody who's listening, pack your glass, roll your J's, warm your bangers, and let's dive into our profiling of the original American drug czar, Harry J. Anslinger. Now, I have mentioned old Harry before. Uh, For those who've been listening a while, if you go all the way back to the very first episode, The Flavor of Legality in Season 1, that was sort of a brief ride through the American history of cannabis law. And now, just to be clear, there was an anti-cannabis sentiment to be found in America well before Anslinger ever got into the picture and started pulling on those strings. You know, he was not the first square to hate on weed, but he was possibly one of the biggest. And so our story begins when Harry was born uh, on May 20th of 1892 in the town of Altoona, Pennsylvania. And that is Altoona spelled with two O's, not with a U like your brain is probably assuming it would be spelled. Like it's all tuna, like the fish. There's Altoona, a little bit different spelling. And what that really means is that Harry was actually a Pennsylvania man. And so I feel a little conflicted and strangely cosmically tied to him because we are both Pennsylvanians. And so he on one side was a silly Pennsylvania boy trying to stop weed, sort of like the fun police. And decades later, on the other side of the state, near Philly, here's a different silly PA boy trying his hardest to fight what the old one was doing, keep it flowing, keep it growing, right? Now, funny enough, currently there are a handful of medical marijuana dispensaries in Altoona, PA. And so it seems that a lot has changed since the time he was born, especially as a guy who was so anti-weed. It's kind of great to have a little wink to say, you know what, Harry, you never were really able to stop it in your own hometown, thankfully, so you can never hold weed off too long. Now, Altoona is a special town, you might say. 
Uh, it is actually a town that was founded by the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. Now, yes, the PA Railroad is one you might remember from board games like Monopoly. Um, Altoona, as far as geography goes, if you think of Pennsylvania, it's kind of a big rectangle. Split it in the middle. I'm on the east side near uh, Philadelphia, right north of it. And on the west side, we have Pittsburgh. And kind of right in between Pittsburgh and the middle line, you have Altoona. So it's on the way to Pittsburgh, but it's mostly on the Pittsburgh side, just a, maybe like two and a half hours, I think, east of that city. Now, Pittsburgh is a mining town, right? Three River Stadium, a lot of industry going on there, especially back during this late part of the 18th century, or 19th century, I should say, the 1800s. And one thing you should know is that most people who live in a railroad town end up working for the railroad. That probably makes a lot of sense. And this was also the case for the Anslinger family as well. You see, uh, his family were actually all new immigrants to the country. His background was mainly German-Swiss, and his parents moved here only a couple years before he was born in 1881, so 11 years before his birth. Now, it's a little, I guess, stabby because given his closely immigrant background, some of the things he did later in life seem even more inflammatory given he wasn't necessarily a you know, multi-generational American. But we'll talk about that more later. We're looking at Harry's birth and once he came into play. His dad ended up switching jobs uh, from a barber to working for the railroad. Once Harry completed the eighth grade, he happened to do the same and went to work for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, uh, again, now we're looking at, you know, if he's after eighth grade, we're probably just in the early 19 or 1900s. And back then, remember, there were not a whole lot of child labor laws. They haven't really been formed or enacted. So working right after eighth grade wasn't really that abnormal. We're not trying to say that he was a moron or anything. That was probably a pretty regular stance for a lot of kids. I mean, I think some kids probably went to work a lot earlier than after the eighth grade. But Harry, like a lot of us, wanted to continue his education. And uh, he was still working at the time, but he did a couple classes for high school. Uh, much like myself, he was not able to get a diploma. Now, I took my GED, but I guess they didn't have that program back then. So after a year or two, he took a couple classes at Altoona Business College and then was able to get a special... I think furlough to be able to do two years at Penn State in business and engineering, which I think makes sense given your work at the railroad. It's kind of been business and engineering in a nutshell. So he continued to work on the rail. And in 1915, at the age of 23, he was a young man. He was actually a part of this, I guess, larger investigation for the railroad into insurance fraud. And he had uh, been able to actually stop like I think it was close to a quarter million dollar payout or uh, actually I think it was $50,000 payout on some insurance fraud. So they rewarded him. Thanks for saving us money, old Harry. You can be the captain of the rail police. And over the next decade, he would continue to work in this investigative capacity for various police and military organizations, both in the U.S. and internationally. And it seemed he had a real penchant for stopping drug trafficking. If anything, it's kind of a preview for his future to come. Now, what do we mean internationally? We're talking places like Japan, Venezuela, Germany, right? Well, some of his, uh, his old immigrant alma mater. And it seems that in some of these countries that he visited, you can actually kind of still taste a little bit of the flavor of Anslinger left over. Apparently, I guess his drug policies were rather popular at the time. And so here we are, uh, a decade into his work. Right at the end of the Roaring Twenties. We're in 1929. So this is only going back, I guess, what, 93 years from now? And Anslinger's feeling himself pretty large because of all the success he's had in drug policing around the globe. So you could imagine 29 years old, perfect age to feel like you're number one. And honestly, up to this point, there's not really a whole lot of argument on exactly who Anslinger was and what he was doing. He seemed to be the world's gift to drug trafficking at that point. But he had a bit of a crass attitude. It seems a lot of folks were saying as he moved forward. And a lot of his actions are well documented. A lot of folks will still say that his motivations were actually very law-abiding, were very logical, and maybe he was actually closer to a saint than a sinner. But it's honestly pretty funny to me, given we're only going back, as I said, you know, 80 to 100 years-ish. And it seems that even going back just that slight amount, right? Human history is thousands of years old. We're going back barely a century and you can see clearly that nobody wants to be remembered 
as being a dickhead, right? Uh, obviously, nobody wants their legacy to be poorly paid. But it's kind of funny because we have on one side of history Anslinger in action. And on the other side, it seems that some of his family, some folks he worked with, some parts of our very good government here in America, choose to recall his service as very distinguished and celebratory even. Now, people say over the course of a lifetime, you know, words are just the sounds that our mouths make. And even though if you've listened to my show at all or it's your first time, you'll notice I love using words. But I've also realized that they don't really mean shit. I mean, literally, I have a cat. She's one of my best friends in life. And we've never spoken, right? There's other ways to communicate. And so words, they're okay. And they're nothing really when compared to actions. We always say, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. So who knows how many words an action could be worth? You know, I can lie all day. But my actions will generally tell the most truth. So we're going to start describing Harry Anslinger with the Hallmark version. The version the government chooses to kind of tell us. The version his friends and his family seem to preserve. And it's also the Anslinger that you will find in most museums. You know, as I said, people like to be remembered for their greatnesses. Um, so I went and I did some research on him for this episode, as you would imagine. And this little excerpt uh, in front of us is from the webpage museum.dea.gov. The DEA is the uh, Department on the Enforcement of Drugs. So Drug Enforcement Agency. And this is the one that ideally Harry's, the Bureau of Narcotics, became the DEA over time. And, you know, they have a lot of nice things to say about their old boss, right? So, and I quote from the website. <clears throat> Following his retirement from personal life, Anslinger settled down in his hometown of Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania. He reminisced that he was born and raised here. These are good people. Nice people to talk to in a pleasant town. Now, no other man, living or dead, has had a greater influence in stemming the illicit traffic in narcotic drugs other than Harry Anslinger. He has gained ground despite the pressure of international intrigue, the ruthless menace of the underworld, and the conspiracy of communism to undermine the morale of its enemies with narcotic drugs. Now, that second statement was made in December of 54. You can kind of tell it sounds December of 54, the whole communism thing being thrown in there. And there was a further quote from the New York Times, uh, an excerpt, saying that a family member, a great nephew named Jefferson Anslinger, said in an interview that his great uncle was an honest man and a patriot with whom he regularly visited. Now that guy sounds pretty nice, doesn't he? Sounds like the ideal American G.I. Joe type, right? You know, why can't we be friends with old Harry Anslinger? Well, in 1930... Hans Anslinger was now starting to work with this newer Bureau of Narcotics. Um, and unfortunately, off the back path of a hall prohibition, right? A lot of mob, a lot of scandal, a lot of unfortunate corruption was a part of their operation. And Anslinger, well, he'd spent 10 years doing the international drug trafficking game, right? He was a straight shooter. He was seen as a man who could not be corrupted. And that's going to be funny as we move forward. So keep that in mind. Couldn't be corrupted, they say. So while running the Bureau, Mr. Anslinger investigated things like the drugging of racehorses with heroin, cocaine, caffeine, and strychnine, right? Racehorses, if you remember, were a very big deal back in the day, sort of like modern sports betting. And so finding out that there was like doping or some sort of drug scandal in horse races was probably pretty big news, sort of like um, you remember what happened with Lance Armstrong, right? And all the doping. You ever hear of the Olympic Russian doping scandal? Not a lot's happened as a result of finding it, but it was a big deal at the time. So imagine Anslinger finding something this thick, right? Definitely uh, got him the job that he wanted. Now, in addition to that, he also established ties with Interpol, right? That's on the European side of things. And he arranged for international drug accords, offered some of the first evidence of the existence of a criminal network controlled by Sicilian Americans. And that means he sniffed out the original Italian M.O.B., the mob, my friends. Now, this obviously was a big deal. It's still a big deal if you find mob contacts in 2022. But it was especially a big deal because of alcohol prohibition just ending. We know how much of the sort of Sicilian Italian mob was a part of that story. Al Capone and all that, funny enough. A man who was imprisoned in the penitentiary in Philadelphia. So, you know, there's a lot of connectivity here in PA 
with a lot of that. But unfortunately, now prohibition was over. Alcohol returned to the legal status. And now there was mounting pressure on that Bureau of Narcotics to find the next enemy, right? The next villain, the next demon rum, as they were obviously villainizing alcohol for a time. You know, a lot of folks would say that when you make something new and they're finished the job, you would just eliminate them. So this department had to find more reasons that it was justified to exist. You have to find that new enemy to fight. And some of this, honestly, for me being in my 30s, does sound very similar to the rhetoric after 2001 with the whole war on terrorism and homeland security kind of finding reasons to exist after the war on terrorism is over. But I do digress. You know, here we are in the 1930s turning up the focus on the old devil's lettuce, right? They seem to like to use devil in a lot of this. And it was at this point that technically if you were into cannabis, you more than likely called it Indian hemp because that was sort of the uh, street name at the time. Uh, But as we know, it is just straight weed, y'all. So many, many approaches to it. You can kind of tell what they call the weed, kind of tells you what they think about it. And so there are criminal organizations like the American Mafiosos that also rose to power selling their alcohol. And now, much like that Bureau of Narcotics, they are also looking for a new vice to sell. You know, alcohol was a moneymaker. And when you make something illegal, it costs even more money, right? You got to pay a lot for that illegal kind of contraband. So if somebody were to go into cannabis and go from a legal to illegal state, guess what's going to happen? The mob's going to jump right on it. Of course, they're going to start charging up and making their money. So funny enough, now the mob and the Fed are both looking for drugs. They're both on the hunt. And uh, there's a bit of a quote I found regarding this time from the Boston Political Review. During the prohibition... Anslinger was indifferent at best in regards to marijuana. He did not want to allocate his already limited resources to yet another drug law when he viewed other narcotics like heroin and cocaine as far more dangerous. And he may have been in search of a new career path. So we can see, remember, these are human beings, right? They have all the same fears and strange decision making that we have today. And so not only was he trying to be the drug boy scout, trying to be the guy who could sniff out any illegal activity, but he also had to stay employed, right? Uh, It showed that during alcohol prohibition, there wasn't really as much of a focus on narcotics outside of opium and opium dens. And you can find a lot of well-regarded published information about opium back then. However, all of a sudden, alcohol's now legal. We got to find a new one. So we switched to weed and we start seeing a lot of this language coming out, which is now kind of demonizing weed to a point which is a little ridiculous, I'm going to be honest with you. Now, I could go through the list of terrible laws in the 30s and 40s, regulations that were passed from Anslinger, trying to make it hard on cannabis to mature and stay legal. I also have the option to go on a character assassination, right? Because Anslinger did say some weird shit. And, of course, that means I give you my personal opinion, which you can hear being woven into the story a little. But instead, at this moment, I'd rather give some facts so you can figure out what you prefer to think of him on your own. Because we are all allowed to make our own judgments. So we already can see that, you know, folks who knew him put a little bit of a stars and stripes halo on the man's head, saying he was just God's gift to find in illegal drugs. But what's the actual truth, right? Those are the words. What are the actions? So I dug up a bunch of helpful things. And here's a list of some quotes from Harry. 11 beautifully horrid quotes Because I think if there's no better way to start the truth, it's looking right at somebody's mouth and seeing what they said themselves. Now, this list is from a website called thebluntness.com. So I'd imagine they are uh, pro-cannabis, anti-anslinger. But I have seen a lot of these quotes elsewhere, so I do not believe any of them are misquotes. So let's run down the list of 11 things that Anslinger said to see how he really felt about drug law, cannabis, and America in general. Number one, marijuana is an addictive drug which produces in its users insanity, criminality, and death. All right, I would say that's pretty extreme. Uh, Number two, you smoke a joint and you're likely to kill your brother. Not too much opinion there. Number three, there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S., and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. They're satanic music jazz and swing result from marijuana usage this marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with negroes entertainers 
and any others. Number four, marijuana with an H leads to pacifism and communist brainwashing. Number five, reefer makes, pardon me, choked on that for a second because it's so freaking racist. Reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. Number six, marijuana is the most violence causing drug in the history of mankind. You could tell this guy like to measure his responses. Uh, number seven, despite the fact that medical men and scientists have disagreed upon the properties of marijuana, and some are inclined to minimize the harmfulness of this drug, the records offer ample evidence that it has a disastrous effect upon many of its users. Now, number seven here feels like you could just say that last week. I mean, I feel like they say this all the time in politics now. They're like, well, a lot of people nowadays feel that marijuana might be harmless. It might be beneficial. And boy, aren't scientists making a hell of a case trying to tell us that we shouldn't think that way. Marijuana still poses a danger. You can see how long this has been going on. We move to number eight. I find that the conclusion reached by persons who've had practical experience with the drug present a much stronger case against marijuana than those formed by a study of literature on the subject. And that's just a classic, you know, anti-science approach. People who are well-read, people who study, can't know as much as a cop or a robber or people who sell the drug. And I go, eh, I don't really think there's a good answer to any of that, technically. And number nine, there must be constant enforcement and constant education against this enemy, which has a record of murder and terror running through the centuries. Uh, number 10, therefore, from the standpoint of police work, it is a more dangerous drug than heroin or cocaine, which, as we heard, was not the way he thought about things in the 20s. And then lastly, on this list of 11 just crude things to say, uh, Harry was quoted in saying, I consider marijuana the worst of all narcotics. Back then it was considered narcotic, of course. Far worse than the use of morphine or cocaine. Under its influences, men become beasts from one, oh, sorry, marijuana destroys life itself. And uh, further quoted in the bottom of this uh, list of 11, they said on thebluntness.com that it wasn't Anslinger alone. He was supported by a strong network of bureaucrats and politicians who shared his beliefs, as well as ignorant newspaper editors hungry for juicy headlines. After Anslinger, subsequent politicians and administrations used anti-drug sentiment and policy to their own benefit from one generation to the next. So it just kind of shows that this is just the format. This is how you attack something politically and how you get reelected. But beyond this, these fucked up statements, there was obviously more. You know, Anslinger was a busy man, and I'm not going to be able to cover every dirty deed he did cheaply over his lifetime. We're really just going to cruise through some of the bigger ones. And so from 1930 to 37, Anslinger used shady tactics to push marijuana with an H into an absolute negative spotlight. Not even a little bit. We can see from his comments uh, that I just mentioned, he was going for the throat. He also kept a collection of what he called gore files, 200 cases in which he said marijuana had caused extreme violence and crime. Now, researchers uh, over the years have found that out of 200 cases, 198 of those were wrongly attributed to cannabis use, while the other two cases left over straight up could not be disproved because there were no records in existence concerning the crimes ever happening. AKA, they were fabricated as lies. I think nowadays a lot of the folks will say it was fake news. So we can see uh, it was a constant in politics, right? A lot of politicians over speaking, talking about folks who know more, saying that they actually know less. He further moved on and ignored the American Medical Association. I would say one of the larger bodies of medical information. When they had 29 of 30 pharmacists and drug industry reps object to his proposals to ban marijuana in the 30s. One such statement by these folks claimed that his proposal to ban marijuana was absolute rot. It is not necessary and I have never known of its misuse. However, uh, the only single dissenter of that, right, the one out of 30 who was talking shit, um, was actually preserved in the Bureau of Files. So imagine that. You hire 30 people to give their opinions, and 29 of them say one thing, one person says the other one, and that one person is the only one you actually log and record. It's pretty fucked up, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and that one noted that he had encountered a doctor 
who had been addicted to marijuana before. So you could bet your ass that a story like that was pushed into the public spectrum, right? Any dissent was absolutely appreciated. You're going to make that the spotlight. And soon after all this kind of nonsense, newspapers were running headlines like murders due to killer drug marijuana sweeping the United States. Now, you might realize that with the show I've been running for a while, this is one reason why I get so flagrantly like just hype and frustrated on articles when they use that kind of, you know, clickbait. It's something that certainly has existed since the newspaper barons and the radio era. But it just it sucks to see these old tricks still being used today to try to move people along and force them to think differently. You know, it's, it really just it kills brain cells, it feels like. Now, beyond just the media, he also targeted famed musician Billie Holiday. This was a movie, The United States versus Billie, I think, or Billie Holiday versus the U.S. Uh, and the timing was that she had just written this song, Strange Fruit, which had become very popular. Now, this song is about people being lynched, people hanging from trees. It's very graphic. It's very sad. I think you can tell from not only the, the sound of the song, if you were to listen to it, but also the lyrics. This woman, unfortunately, knew suffering. And so people hang from trees like strange fruit and kind of see how she made that one work. Now, this made Anslinger absolutely furious because he seemed to have some racist undertones to his thinking. Maybe just a couple from the list we read earlier. And so he had one of the few black agents in his department, a federal agent named Jimmy Fletcher, try to infiltrate into Billie Holiday's sort of group and find evidence that she was doing drugs. Not if she was doing drugs, that she was actually doing drugs. Now, this is something that they show in this movie. I've not seen it, but I read about it recently. And, uh, you know, they kind of pursue, there was like a love story between them, which may have been more fabricated by the movie industry. However, uh, Fletcher did say that he did not really see her ever use cannabis. He did, however, see her drink plenty and use a bunch of coke. So ideally back then, you know, Anslinger said that jazz music resulted from smoking weed. Uh, he wasn't quite accurate. Uh, a lot of bebop, a lot of early jazz as an ex-musician, I would say was actually heavily informed by amphetamines. So uppers, right? Things that make you racy. Uh, ideally in modern day, that would be like Adderall was more the drug of choice for jazz musician, uh, musicians than marijuana would have been at the time. So as long as we can close that loop a little bit, she was on the amphetamine side of it, which looking at history, if you look at the 50s especially, Mother's Little Helper, the Stones wrote a song about it, amphetamines were unfortunately common in the way they were being prescribed at that point, but opiates were bad. Marijuana was on that side of it. And so she famously struggled with an opiate addiction, oh, Billy Holiday, and he literally pursued her to her death as a result of the fact that he did not like what she was doing and kind of considered her like the core celebrity he hated, the core musician he wanted to make an example of. Uh, she was arrested, I think, three times by his people over the course of her later career. But infamously, in the May of 47, she was arrested and served uh, 366 days in prison. So just a day over a year and went through withdrawal and all sorts of terrible things. Uh, funny enough, the story only ends that she was literally arrested and handcuffed on her deathbed by his team. Um, it is a sad story, honestly, because uh, being an addict, unfortunately, withdrawal can kill you, especially when you're in your older years as she was. And so there she is in the hospital going through withdrawal. And after 10 days, he had her methadone cut off at his request. And so naturally, her condition began to tank and she died in that very same bed. Uh, I wouldn't say she would necessarily survive had she had more methadone, but obviously comfort's a big part of what we consider hospice care. And if you were to just let somebody suffer to death, I think that's almost the definition of an inhuman approach. And funny enough, at the same time, we have Judy Garland, uh, a white actress who is well known. You know, she's a triple threat. She can sing, she can dance, she can act. I uh, saw her in a lot of movies back in the day. And she also has a well-known opiate addiction that Anslinger was made aware of, documentation and everything. But instead of arresting her and fucking with her meds when she's in the hospital, he just told her to take longer vacations. So here we have really just some nice proto-evidence of how if you are standing over here and you happen to be darker or different, here's your punishment. But if you're standing over here in the whiteness of the light, yeah, she's got a bright future, right? He had a lot of, uh, a lot of things ahead of him. We don't want to punish folks who naturally are part of, of the ruling class, right? The nobles. The nobles don't have to serve time. And so the capstone of this middle era of his career 
uh, was if anything shown by his ignoring of a report, a famous report from the LaGuardia Committee. Now, this is the same LaGuardia that they named, yes, New York airplane, um, you know, or the airport after LaGuardia. Uh, at the time, the mayor, Fiorello, I'm probably mispronouncing this, but Fiorello La Guardia was the one who really promoted this idea. So in 1939, he gets a five year study done trying to look into the effects of smoking cannabis. And funny enough, I bet we're still waiting for a good modern study on this because we're still fighting this battle. Now, this was the first in depth study to look at cannabis scientifically and all of its claims systemically and systematically contradicted claims made by the U.S. Treasury Department and the Bureau of Narcotics, who said that smoking marijuana results in insanity. And so this LaGuardia Committee, this LaGuardia Report, actually determined that, quote, the practice of smoking marijuana does not lead to addiction in the medical sense of the word. So they knew this back in the late 30s, right? This report was released in 1944, uh, a year off of the end of World War II, just to put it in history for folks out there. And this report naturally pissed off Anslinger, who condemned it as, quote unquote, unscientific. And he furthermore kind of defunded them and said, if you ever want to study marijuana again, it's got to come through me and kind of only in pursuit of the answer I'm looking for. If we study it, it's to prove it makes you insane. If we study it, it's to prove that it's bad for you. And this is the beginning of what is kind of, you know, data selection bad politics. I mean, we're still dealing with this shit all the time. Now on a tangent, are there any recent times in politics anybody out there might be able to think of where there have been a politician talking about scientific scientific information and evidence as unscientific because it doesn't agree with the narrative they're trying to push on their personal platforms? Hmm? Any recent political things have happened? I don't know, COVID, uh, riots, there's just been a lot of things, right? And politicians seem to always say what they want you to think, but maybe not what it actually is. And so we find even back in the 40s, this exact same card was being played. All oh, these scientists, they're experts. We depend on them for so much until they say something I don't like. And then they're fucking idiots and they're reading too much. And, you know, people out in the streets know more than people who study. And I'm not saying that one's better than the other. We just need both, thankfully. But this 1944 report was pretty potent. And with five years of research, the committee end up drawing up 13 salient points with conclusions they had reached. So sort of the 13 points to remember from this report. Uh, the first point, uh, marijuana is used extensively in the borough of Manhattan, but the problem is not as acute as it is reported to be in other sections of the U.S. Now, I'm not really sure what the background of that comment was, but it sounds like somebody was saying that everybody in Manhattan smokes weed and nowhere else. And I had found a lot of evidence of and Slinger talking about how he feels that it must be, you know, colorful people, ethnic people, disproportionately using the drugs more than white people. This is something we saw all the way through the 80s into the 90s into modern day, that it must be all the blacks, must be all the Hispanics, must be all the non-white Americans who are the reason we have all this damage, or the reason for it, right? You can find a lot of this language in the immigration policies of who's coming up from the lower border and whether or not they deserve to be treated in a certain way. Very similar ideas being repeated. Uh, statement number two, the introduction of marijuana into this area is recent as compared to other localities. Number three, the cost of marijuana is low and therefore within the purchasing power of most persons. Number four, the distribution and use of marijuana is centered in Harlem. Obviously, this was the LaGuardia report. It's mostly about New York. Uh, number five, the majority of marijuana smokers are blacks and Latin Americans. Number six, the consensus among marijuana smokers is that the use of the drug creates a definite feeling of adequacy. Now, in these two, right, I just said, well, maybe they're kind of fudging the numbers and saying it's mostly colorful people smoking. And then this report says it is mostly colorful people smoking. But herein is a very semantic thing to notice. They said the majority of marijuana smokers. You see, marijuana was usually used as a tincture back then. So a lot of folks who had more money, who had access to like legitimate medical care, as you'd imagine in the early part of the 1900s, medical care wasn't really something most people had access to. Unfortunately, we still don't have all people having access to it at this point, 100 years later. But that means that some people were smoking it, some people were taking it as a tincture or eating it. And there is a difference between the two and the way they were treated. 
Uh, much like with crack and cocaine in D.C. in the 80s, you know, there's, there's always two different rule sets, right, depending on your class. Uh, but we move on to, what's it, one, two, three, four, five, six, to number seven. The practice of smoking marijuana does not lead to addiction in the medical sense of the word. Number eight, the sale and distribution of marijuana is not under the control of any single organized group. Doesn't that sound like a response to somebody saying it's just the mob or the blacks, right, or the Asians, it's all their fault? It's very interesting. You can imagine the question being asked at these answer. Uh, moving on, the use of marijuana does not lead to morphine or heroin or cocaine addiction. And no effort is made to create a market for these narcotics by stimulating the practice of marijuana smoking. Marijuana is not the determining factor in the commission of major crimes. Marijuana smoking is not widespread among school children. Juvenile delinquency is not associated with the practice of smoking marijuana. And lastly, the publicity concerning the catastrophic effects of marijuana smoking in New York City is unfounded. Therefore, according to the Guardia report, the gateway drug theory is without foundation, period, end of sentence. That is what they found. So isn't that all stuff that you wish most people knew at this age? I mean, you might be listening to this episode because you wanted to know those things. And they knew this back in the 30s and 40s. Yet we are still trying to dig this up in 2022. It's insane to me sometimes how slowly we can move, even with all the evidence in front of us. But some consequences happened. Uh, as we said, he branded this as unscientific. He denounced the mayor, the New York Academy of Medicine, and the doctors who had worked on it for more than five years. Um, he then said that they should not conduct more experiments or studies on marijuana without his personal permission. He interrupted current research on derivatives of cannabis that were in 44 and 45. So we might have known about like THCV early, but he stopped a lot of that. And he also personally commissioned the AMA to prepare a position which would reflect the one of the government. So that is legitimately just saying, stop what you're doing and start just saying what I say, right? Do as I say, not as I do. Now, um, as they move forward, this study conducted by the AMA, having uh, disproportionate statements against what he said versus with what he said, also mentioned uh, the test group that they used. And this is something that he jumped on. Anslinger was one to always do character assassination. So um, they ch showed that the group that was actually used had some black people in them, had some white people in them, had a couple of people in them, right? And he said that as a result, uh, there were lies, right? The data was bad. And those who smoked marijuana became disrespectful of white soldiers and officers during military segregation. So really what I just choked through there, trying to get it out a little smoother than I did, was that uh, even though they studied this and showed otherwise, he just said, yeah, but you were studying black people. So at the end of the day, they don't really count. And so that kind of summated the middle zone, right, where he was most actively against marijuana. He did a lot, but those were a couple of things I don't think that get talked about as much or looked at in that light. And then moving on, we find ourselves in the last chapter of Anslinger, his later years. Now, although the market was with him early on, right, he didn't really have too much dissent. He was able to crush most of his opposition in the earlier phases. As time went on, he found himself a lot less supported. You know, he was actually scrutinized for insubordination because he refused to stop trying to halt a joint report on narcotic addiction from the ABA and the AMA. And this was something that they feel might have started a weakness position and get him out of the job he had. Um, there was a gentleman named Linda Smith or Lynn Smith who had written quite a bit of works on opiate addiction, the addict and the law, and other articles condemning the criminalization of addiction. And a lot of what Lynn Smith did moving forward was critical of this war on drugs that was really getting together at this point. And he very specifically condemned Anslinger's part in that process. And so it started to kind of pull the rug out from under Anslinger, show that he may not be so popular now as he was, you know, 20 years ago. Now, in his later years, Anslinger also suffered a mental breakdown and was characterized by, I mean, all mental breakdowns, intense paranoia, irrational thoughts, and things like believing that addiction was contagious and that addicts had to be quarantined or even talking about secret plots throughout the world. Uh, and he was eventually hospitalized due to this breakdown. And this 
does bring up an interesting thought because it does sound like Anslinger was halfway to QAnon at that point, right? Now, if you live a life of constant suspicion, paranoia, and sus activities, it can destabilize the mind because, you know, you get what you practice. And if you constantly juggle the truth with a bunch of lies in the air, and you keep those lies very close to the truth, right? Like the things he said in those top 11 things, you, you not only say them, but you make them convictions. Then the real question is, when your memory starts to get a little loose, right? When it gets hard to recall what happened when I was younger, which ideas do you think you'll remember the most when your memories fade? Are you going to remember the quiet truth or the very loud lies? And that brings some intrigue into our story, because in his final years, he obviously started to lose his mind a little bit. And now I lived with a Vietnam vet. My father served two tours. You know, his mind loosened similarly. And although he wasn't obviously in a position like this, uh, you always have to think, you know, later on in life, we're going to change. We're going to be different people. How will how we are now affect that individual? It's going to make me that racist old grandpa, right, who can't keep it in. Am I going to become potentially more tolerant, more worldly as I get older and my experiences teach me more? You know, there's, not everybody turns out to be the peaceful old grandparent that gives you good advice. Although some people think he did. But um, in his last couple years, he actually was reappointed as the head of the Bureau. Uh, Kennedy became president, and in 61, he reappointed Anslinger, which was a surprise to Anslinger because in 62, he turned 70, which was the retirement age for the position. And on his birthday in 1962, Harry handed in his resignation. He worked for like most of the year after that because he didn't have a replacement ready, but then replaced him and eventually that department became the DEA. But there were a few interesting things that kind of came up in his later years. Uh, you see, as he got old, Harry eventually became blind by the early 70s and he developed something called angina. If you don't know about it, it's a painful condition where not enough blood gets to the heart, but it's also characterized by a lot of intense like chest pain and architectural pain. Now, although he may have been diagnosed late in life, I suspect he may have had issues with blood in his heart his whole life because he acted rather heartlessly, I would say. Uh, for a man who spent many years as an anti-narcotic czar in the anti-drugs capacity, he actually ended his life being addicted to morphine. I honestly find that just so damn interesting. Uh, kind of one of those cr cruel ways stories can end. But even more so than that, as a man who is seen as you know, vetted, unshakable, you know, a man who was beyond corruption. He also was found to be drug dealing to Senator McCarthy. That's right, Joe McCarthy, old Joe, the father of what is the Red Scare, the blacklist anti-communist movement of the 50s, you know, where they were uh, going at, you know, certain celebrities, certain movie stars for their left-leaning ideas, trying to get any pinko stinko out of the market that you can. And so here's Senator Joe McCarthy telling everybody to be a better American, pointing the finger at every person he can find. And meanwhile, the guy who's anti-narcotics is selling opiates to McCarthy. Uh, at some point, you know, Anslinger seemed to have his conscience come up and he told McCarthy he should stop. But McCarthy says, but the scandal that would come out to the public would be so damaging that we shouldn't stop. And so literally... From whatever point they started until McCarthy died, Harry J. Anslinger ended up being his illegal drug dealer. And even more so, all of that morphine was bought at a local pharmacy and paid for by the fucking Bureau. So here we are on the one hand, right? Smacking immigrants, trying to go at jazz music like it's the devil sound, and really ruining a lot of lives, not only in that portion, but for years to come. Meanwhile, he is literally selling pills to McCarthy in the bathroom at Congress, getting him high as balls and just saying, well, you just don't want to tell anybody. So you really do have to appreciate whether or not, you know, this person was as consistent, as moral, as distinguished as everybody says, because that is some bullshit if I ever heard it. Now, something I've noticed from our great politicians, leaders, people around the world who have very nice suits packed with money, you know, a lot of them seem to use this tactic where they accuse others of exactly what they are doing wrong. So, you know, Epstein, right? He was son of a bitch who had like molestation island. Well, if Epstein was your neighbor and started hosting to catch a predator, it'd make you feel pretty confused, right? Because he is the very predator we're trying to catch. 
But a lot of times I think the way it comes off in the politician's mind and this interesting mindset is if I'm planning to steal, right? I want to steal a bunch of money. The best first start, I guess, is to appear like I'm anti-theft. So I'll tell you that everyone else around you is likely a thief. You got to make sure you lock up your goods. You got to make sure that you, you do the right thing. Hell, I'll even sell you the safe that I'm going to break into later because the guy who sells you the safe, he can't be the thief, right? No one's ever going to suspect that guy. So then, fast forward, something gets stolen. Well, the last person you're going to look at is, is the anti-theft person. So they may even hire you after the theft to say, hey, can you help us know what happened so you can help us in the future? And this, unfortunately, I would say is a pretty common thing we see nowadays uh, people often trying to like get you off the scent of their trail by just saying, he did it. No, he did it. No, everybody's doing it except for me. And like that still fucking works somehow. It, it blows my mind how simple that idea is, but how easily people are willing to fall into, oh, there's the bad person. You run that way. And the other person just laughs as they steal your shit. Now, there are a lot of people out there who have discriminatory things to say on preference of race, gender, sexuality. But I bet if you were to look at their porn history, you would see it's colorful as fuck, you know? This is really gaslighting 101. And even back then, before the term existed, they were doing it. Present the lie early and often. Question the question whenever it comes up. Bury the truth. And then naturally probably go absolutely nuts when you're old and lose track of exactly what's true and what's false. And it really sucks because the very first step of gaslighting looks exactly the same as the first step of whistleblowing. If you're trying to let somebody know something is going to harm them, you're going to ring all the alarms. You're going to be like, oh, you got to watch out. Something's happening that's bad. But technically, it looks the same. You know, The only difference is what time provides, what that person's actions really show their intention was. And so, to finish up on Harry J. Anslinger, a PA-born son of immigrants, he died in the very same railroad town that he was raised in. On November 14th of 1975, he was 83 at the time, and he was survived by a son and a sister. And funny enough, his now grandson swears that he never let it slip. He swears that he was great. Um, the family member, the great nephew Jeffrey uh, Jefferson Anslinger, said, and I quote, I never heard him say anything disparaging about any race. He said his whole life was dedicated to easing the suffering from drugs from around the world. And just remember, my friends, an absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. So you never heard him say anything disparaging about any race. Well, that's fine. But I imagine you're his grandson, right? So you probably weren't born for most of the time he was alive in his sentient years when he was managing this war on drugs in his early stages. So I absolutely believe, uh, Jefferson, that he never heard his great grandpapa utter a bad word. I think nowadays with modern cell phones, we've heard a lot of people say, I didn't say anything wrong. And then the recording comes out with the locker room talk, right? So I think we can believe that if that happens now, if people misspeak all the time now with all the electronic devices, making sure we know what they said, I bet back then moving ever further back in history, it was easy. I didn't say that. My word versus theirs, right? And I'm the, I'm the leader of the Bureau of Narcotics. My word always wins. So once again, gaslighting at its finest, right? Now, anyways, after Anslinger passed, the war on drugs intensified, entered a new phase, you might say, because Nixon grabbed the reins and continued to really push the suffering button, causing massive damage and trauma to U.S. citizens, tax payers, you know, Americans, the red-blooded, whatever you want to call them to make them feel like they're people you can actually feel are valuable. All because of these discriminatory practices, which honestly, he was kind of raised on, right? Anslinger beat him to it. But that is a story, Nixon, for a different time. Because today, it was all about Anslinger, a man who is buried, uh, you know, to the west of me right now. And really has been a huge force as to why we seem to have so much work to do with a lot of this negative stigma with cannabis. You know, all of the racial undertones, all of the insanity undertones, all of the violence, all of just the feeling that even though it's a plant and we've seen so much about it, we still have to weave in that one last thought that no matter how beneficial it is, no matter how medicinal it can be, it can still make you go crazy and kill people. And even today, if you were to look up just modern 
Marijuana News, you will still find articles referring to the same basic ideologies, the same basic practices that Harry Anslinger was supporting. Just the idea of fear-based thinking. Because, oh my God, what will happen when the white women start hanging out with the black folks, right? What will happen when we start misogynating, right? Every father's fear comes up. Oh my daughter, oh my daughter. Because it seems to be the easiest way to stroke control. Let me just tell everybody to be afraid that they're coming in to replace you. They're coming in to change the way you want to live. They're telling you that you have no value. And it's funny because as they stimulate sort of white fear with this constantly, I mean, the great replacement theory coming up seems to mimic this exact same stage. I need people to vote me into office. I need people to give me money. Let me make them afraid of hell of the other folks who do not have their best intentions in mind. Let me tell them about how scary it is when you go outside and everybody's trying to fucking kill you. Despite the fact that all of these shooters of multiple deaths and things seem to fall outside of the realm of who we're supposed to be afraid of, right? And they minimize the damage there. I know it's a bit of a hot take, but it just, there's a lot of modern news where you can see this approach. And it just pains me to know that we still have people not able to see clearly what's going on. People who lead lives just full of fear, full of tension because they believe this crap. You know, they think it actually has merit. They think these folks actually have their best intentions at heart. And in some crude way, they might because they're just trying to kind of do an us versus them mentality. It just there's room for everybody. I guarantee it. We have enough. You don't always have to think it's either me or you. That zero sum game shit really does create division. And that seems to be the basis of a lot of this thinking. Divide and conquer, right? Easiest way to win. And that, my friends, is all I have for you today. Harry J. Anslinger from the cradle to the grave. So thank you, everybody, for listening and hanging in there with me. I hope you enjoyed the story. Uh, check me out on Instagram if you like what you heard, at, at the Cannabis Professor, no dot anymore. And you can feel free to jump in and DM me if you like this format, want to hear more like this, or just any ideas you'd like to hear on the show. I'll also check out the video for these episodes, which launches like a week or two behind each episode, on YouTube. Look up the U.S. Chamber of Cannabis or search the Cannabis Professor. And then also, as my last promo, be sure to go to chillfrogcbd.com and use code PROFESSOR30 at checkout to save 30% on any CBD items you tend to buy from them. Thank you very much once again, and until next time, my friends, be sure to grow knowledge, and much like with this research, extract the truth. This is The Professor, out. Out.